Hey, this is Glennon. Thanks for coming out. I'm going to jump right into it by answering a few questions that I'm often asked. Like, how did I get into the storage auction business? The quick answer is, I just fell into it. I had a good friend who later on became my partner, who was really crazy about flea markets, garage sales, and long story short, I was selling stuff from my commercial furniture business online, eBay and Craigslist, and just got so successful with that, it became more desirable to sell used items than new items because you could get just a much better margin. And sometimes I was getting things for free and just essentially started running out of used stuff. And I was like, where can we get used stuff? And we started doing research and we found out about storage auctions and started attending them. And here we are. Essentially had a garage sale that netted out quite well that gave us a very good base of operating capital. And, you know, for eight years, that was a large part of my life. And to answer the question that is often put to me, I've put up a video and people still keep missing it. It's like, if the storage auction business is so good, why aren't you in it? Great question. One, I got sick. I still really don't know what the hell happened to me, but there was no way for me to continue in the business because it seriously affected my mobility. I was tired all the time, didn't want to get out of bed. It was not the exact position you want to be in if you're in this business. And then my partner was diagnosed with cancer, who died last June. So, you know, it was like I got sick, she got sick, and essentially we had to shut the business down. So it's really not a question of me giving up the storage auction business as the storage auction business gave up on me. And once I started right, I wrote the book and started doing the webinars. This is just my opinion. I honestly don't think that I can do this business and also teach others how to do this business and be 100% honest. I don't, I couldn't do it. There was just, you know, since I'm not going to be competing with you in any shape, fashion, or form, I can tell you everything that I know. If I was still out there, I would hold back some things. I would have to hold back some things. I could not give you all my tricks. It just, I couldn't do it. And probably if I got back in the business, the YouTube channel would come down and the book would disappear. Because there's no way. I'm like, you know, essentially, I'm going to set myself up in a very, very bad situation by giving you this information, teaching you how to do this business, and also being out there. I mean, I had like a weird dream where I was at the auction and I couldn't get anything. And every time I looked up, somebody was reading my book and using my own stuff against me. That right there didn't sit too well. So that's how I ended up getting out of the business. And that's why I've also made the decision. I'm not getting back in it. I'm just not. It, at this juncture, it's going to be, in my estimation, worse because... I've really built a huge body of work with the videos, the blogs, and the books. It's just that this juncture doesn't really make a lot of sense to actually depart from that, to jump back in the business. To it, it makes no sense to me. And also, I've always had this dream of being a writer, and you know, I want to write a novel and I want to put on a play. And there's all these things I want to do. And as you know, I teach you. You have to make choices. I don't honestly believe that you can have everything and, you know, have everything you want. I don't believe in that. I think you have to make choices. And one of the choices that I made was to move forward with the writing thing, the creative thing, and leave the storage auction thing behind. So during that, you know, you get the benefit of me being totally unvarnished. If you've been watching the channel and you've seen the stuff that I put out since 2009, I was never one of those people that told you the storage auction business was easy because it's not. It's not even close to easy. It's a very, very hard enterprise. But that's one of the reasons that it's so rewarding because it's so hard. Nine out of ten people that jump in are going to jump out. And they're going to jump out very quickly. Within a week or two or the first three months, they're going to be gone because the average American does not want to work that hard. Just not going to do it. And 
that leaves a lot of opportunity out there. What I want to do in this webinar, and you know, this first section is going to be, you know, theory, you know, as I said, you know, letting you know why I got out the business, just to give you more information. Because on the second session, which you know, you will get an invite, it'll just come to your in inbox. We're gonna really touch on a lot of different stuff. But that's that. And also let me say this. Uh, the email address for this webinar is bootcamp at storageauctionguru.com. I have like six different email addresses. And if you email me from anything other than that, I'm not going to address it because then it creates all this extra work. If it goes to bootcamp at storageauctionguru.com, I know it's webinar related and I know I need to jump on it. So that's why I'm being like that because it helps me to help you do this faster and to be more on point. Another thing with that is I'm not taking questions during the webinar because in the course of doing probably a few hundred personal consultations, talking to people, one question leads to six. And I'll have one person ask a probably really good question. And next thing you know, 15, 20 minutes of the webinar are gone. And it just doesn't really move along. And that's why I've chose to do it in this manner. And, you know, that way, the next session, it'll be front loaded with those questions if there are any. And then we'll move on and it'll just keep the thing much smoother and you won't be here all freaking night. Here's a little history about storage auctions. Like, you know, what exactly are storage auctions? Because there's a lot of confusion with that. Storage auctions are a lien sale. Essentially, they're an eviction of the contents of the room. If you've ever rented a storage unit, you know that it's a very lengthy form you have to fill out, you have to buy insurance. It's pretty involved because you're ex you're signing a lease. A similar lease like when you rent an apartment or a house from someone. It's that type of lease. And all 50 states have a lien process in place. Now understand, doesn't mean that the storage facilities are going to follow those laws. Just because they don't follow them doesn't mean that they're not governed by them. There's a lot of places that are doing some crazy stuff. that are doing illegal stuff. When a person becomes delinquent, after so many days, once the storage facility files the lien status, believe it or not, the stuff in the unit becomes the property of the storage facility. Yes, it does. Now, I know you're going, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's scary. If there's a property, they could do whatever they want, right? Actually, no, because this is the rub. If you watch my videos, and we've talked for many years now, a few years now, you know that there's this one thing that happens, and it happens frequently. The tenant has a propensity for paying at the last freaking minute. Now, they may have possession of the stuff and legal ownerships, but that's not their business. They don't want that stuff. They know that, you know, that there's really nothing they can do with it or it's really going to be a loss. They want that rent. So 99.8% of the storage facilities are never going to touch it because they know that this person can come in and they have the legal right to come in and pay at the last minute. And then they take the stuff out and they take what they want. And then the person sues them and wins. So that's that's the little, it's a little tricky and it's a little weird. In the coming weeks, I'm actually, I have a good friend that I've known for years who was a storage manager. And we're going to do an interview and I'm going to put it on YouTube of what are the lien laws, what should you do, what's permissible, what's not permissible. And there's some things that are in the legislature right now that are really interesting. But... In a nutshell, this is something that's been around for 40 years, probably 50 in some areas. And, you know, it's just becoming known because of the shows. But th they're lean cells. It's an eviction because they really can't, you know, they can't do anything with that spot until that stuff's out of there. But it's really, really well-documented procedure. And believe it or not, if you catch someone and you can have proof, and that's the real critical thing, proof 
not hearsay, not what you think, but what you know and what you can prove, you can get a storage facility in a lot of trouble. I think there's more heat and more eyes on this business than ever before. So it used to be if you ratted someone out and you got barred, if nothing happened, then, you know, you pretty much burnt yourself. But now you can't you 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 inform on someone. I guarantee you they're going to clean up their act because they can face not only being sued by the tenants, but they can face some actions by the state and states are looking for money. So they really don't want to go down that path. Now, here's the big question. Why are there so many storage auctions? The number one reason there are so many storage auctions is there's so many storage facilities. There's roughly 55,000 storage facilities in the United States, and it may be closer to 60. And last time I really checked, it was around 55,000. That was a few years ago. There's so many of them, and each storage facility is going to have anywhere from 400 spots up to maybe 1,600 spaces they can rent. It's all about the numbers. Say, you know, the average store facility has 600, 700 rooms and 10 come up for auction every month. Sounds like a lot, right? But really, based on the numbers, they have like 700 rooms. You know, it's, it's like 10 come up. You know, they would have to have 70 rooms come up for it to be 10%. You know, so we're not even, we're, you know, most of them fall between 1% and 3%. How many rooms they have, that's what comes up for auctions. Now, some neighborhoods are worse than others where that number is going to be higher because people are poor. But based on the number of rooms that they have for rent, based on the number of rooms they have rent, the percentage is not that high. Because I do remember one manager was freaking out when they, one month they had 8% of their rooms going up for auctions. And they were just like, the person was like, I could get fired. Because, you know, we really need to do something to change this up. So, so that, you know, think of it in larger numbers. 55,000 storage facilities across the country. Those are millions of rooms. Millions. And probably 1.2 to 1.8 million rooms go for auction every year. This is a very esoteric type business. There's a lot of stuff that's, you know, it would take, it could be documented how many rooms actually go for auction. It would just take someone about two or three years to actually get their hands on it because they would have to go to each storage facility. Because what you see in the announcements for the lien sales are only part of the story because 70% of those people are going to pay up. So if there's 30 rooms in the paper for sale, you could just go ahead and pull 21 out most of the time because folks will pay up sometimes at the last minute. But one of the reasons that there are so many auctions is because we live in a country of pack rats. You know, I was watching this public storage commercial and it was this guy and his wife was trying to get rid of some stuff. And he was like, nope, no garage sale here. And then it was like, bam, public storage is the solution. So you have people who have all this crap that, and I'm not talking about pictures. I'm not talking about personal mementos. I'm talking about, you know, you're saving the surfboard that you got in the eighth grade and it's got a hole in it and it serves no purpose and it's just this big old memento and that's one thing but when you have like a hundred other pieces like that that's just clutter and junk and people have that stuff and it's like they can't part with it so they go ahead and they put it in a storage facility and end up paying anywhere from hundreds to several thousands dollars a you know over the course of a lifetime to store this crap if you've seen recently there is a a video I'm going to put up. Grandmother got left in the storage unit. <laughs> People are wilding out with that stuff. But the reason, simply put, is we as Americans have too much stuff. We have far too much stuff. Don't really know how to pare down. And we have kind of like a McDonald's, you know, biggie size, super size type lifestyle. It's like what we want is what we want. And we can have what we want with little or no consequences. Well, that's not true because the consequences are cropping up all across the America right now. And really, you know, you, you, you can't have all that stuff. But that's one of the reasons we have so many storage auctions because 
you'll have people who have a new home and they have all the furniture and stuff that they want at home, but they got good furniture and they paid really nice money for it and they just can't part for it with it, but they didn't sit down and do simple math. I paid $3,000 for this furniture. I'm paying $300 a month to store it. So in one year, they've actually paid for it twice plus $600. They keep it in there two years. They've doubled. You see the math? A lot of people don't really think of it in those terms that they're actually paying for the stuff two and three times by storing it. First, just liquidating and then moving on. The average American does not think anymore. This is one of the reasons that the storage business is so huge. And it's kind of booming because a lot of people are not thinking the economy is not getting any better, but it's not getting any worse. And people are going back to their old habits. So this is going to be around for a long, long time, because until we change this as a country, clutter, extra stuff, people losing their stuff is not going to change. Now, you know, the touched on the lean process. Now, this is a really, really big question. Get this question like 10 times a day. How do you find the storage auctions? I'm going to give you my methodology and I'm going to give you the reason why I did it that way. First of all, you need to do your own work. With the advent of these shows, there are so many storage facility locator lists or storage auction lists and they have all the auctions and you know, for some of them are free, some of them charge you and you get this list. The biggest problem with that list is, what did I tell you? So many people wait to the last minute to pay. So that list becomes invalid shortly after it's printed up. Now, my methodology was do it the hard way. I know, you know, people don't want to hear that. I went to the phone book. My partner went to the phone book and we called up each facility for the facilities that had like list, we call those. And see, even when they have lists, you still have to tell, stay on top of them because public storage will change their districts at least twice a year. And if you're not staying on top of your information, you're going to miss auctions. So call up the storage facility. Say, hey, you know, my name is Storage Hound X. And when do you have auctions? How often do you have auctions? What are your process? Do you have a clean out fee? What do I need to do? And so on and so forth. And you create your own list because many of these slower or smaller storage list companies actually miss properties because some of them are getting their information from like auction zip or, you know, you'll have certain auctioneers that have their own website with a list of all the auctions they're going to have that month. You know, and they will be auction zip or it'll be their own URL. You have to do your own work. I'm sorry to disappoint you. You can't automate it because you have so many t intangibles in there that will just screw up a list. I'll give you an example. Say you go to one of these sites, you get the list, right? You go by the list, the day of the auction, you're rolling there, you get there, and there's no one, you know, and there's people there, and you go in the office, like, oh yeah, it was canceled. If you do not make your phone calls, if you do not stay on top of your data, you won't know this. So you essentially have wasted the gas and the time to get there. Now, this is the rub. And this is something, you know, I did this in the beginning because I didn't know how this whole thing worked. You could actually be missing an auction because you're not on top of your data. Because when I went out, I did what you're doing. I went by the published list. Everybody was there. Then I went to this one place and... The auction was like canceled. And I saw this veteran. I knew he was a veteran because I've seen him in several auctions. And I saw him kind of like try to sneak off, right? You know, he was trying to tiptoe. And I was like, oh, okay. And he actually got out of the parking lot before I could get really behind him. But, you know, he had this big old truck. He was kind of hard to miss. And I actually caught up with him like four minutes later. And I followed him to another auction that I did not even know about. Now, this is the thing. I didn't get right up on his ass. I kind of stayed back, you know, 10, 11 cars behind because once we got about maybe eight, nine miles in, I had a feeling where he was going because I knew it was in that area. And sure enough, we got to their place and there was only four people there when we arrived. So six people, 18 units. Now, if I didn't have the foresight to see his ass sneaking off, I would have missed that auction and I would have never known about it. And that prompted me to really work hard and just call up. And like I said, it's not easy. These places, some places will ignore you. I think it's more easy now than it was back in my day because with the shows, 
You know, a lot of these places are auction friendly now. You know, it used to be like, eh, don't call us. We don't, we don't have auctions or we'll let you know. Many of these storage facilities, the auctions are a pain in the butt. It's a lot of time. It's a lot of effort. And they really don't like having them. Believe it or not, they don't want to sell those people stuff. They want them to pay the money and be a happy tenant. But do your own research. With the list, you're going to miss stuff. Uh, one of the bigger lists, the uh, owners like, we're going to have like text. And I really, you know, honestly think that's bullshit because going back to what I know about how these places work, for them to actually go into the system, all right, give you an example. The day of auction is chaos in the auction, right? It's an office, it's just chaos. Because this is what's happening the district manager or the auctioneer is there. But the property manager is going to be on the phone saying, hey, this is D from Public Storage. You know, your unit's your, going to go for auction in about 30 minutes to an hour. If you can pay, if you can give me a credit card, if we can come. They're, they're working both angles. So they're sitting there trying to collect from the customer. And then they're going to send you a text saying it was canceled or it's still on. I mean, really, what's their higher priority? Making sure that you come to the auction and buy it or trying to get that money out of their customer. They're always going to try to get that money out of the customer. They're always going to try to make a deal with that customer because it's in the best interest of the company and it's in the best interest of the tenant. So screw you. That's why I think it's just going to be, you know, it's total bullshit because I have been in the office hundreds of times watching this process. And I don't really think it's going to change because... I just don't. So that's why I think, you know, you know, get the list, you know, find out some places to call, but compile your own database. Stay on top of your information. Get to know the district manager. Get to know the people at the storage facilities that you frequent a lot. That's going to pay off more than getting this list. And another reason to do your own work. When you follow these lists, these paid lists, these heavily advertised lists, you are following the crowd. <laughs> so essentially, you're like, yeah, I don't have to do the work. I'm automating. You know, I'm doing this stuff. And you're falling right into the, the boiling pot of fire of crowds. The most well-publicized auctions will be the most crowded auctions. So once again... By doing your own research, by putting together your own list, you will be able to find hidden spots or less travel spots or less attended auctions. And even today, because I have a storage auction group on Facebook, and currently I'm not admitting any new members because I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but put out the question of the day, what are the crowds like? And it just depending on where you are geographically, some places is nuts. Other places, hey, crowds back to normal. I'm, I'm telling you. So there, there are a lot of ways for you to do well in this business even today. All right, we're going to start with page 18. And there's this statement that I put in there that I really like. And I'm going to emphasize on it and break it down for you. If you are flaky and cannot commit to anything more than a few weeks or months, you're not going to go far in life, this business, or in any other event. One of the things that I saw with people getting into this business, and this was long before the shows, this was long before all the hoopla, and this was long before the cat came out the bag, is for every 50 people that came out, one would stay. People would come out and Maybe they heard a story or they had a friend that was in the business who saw someone get a big hit. And that was the big expectation, which wasn't realized within a few weeks or a few months. And they would come out and they would be full of piss and vinegar. And yeah, I've got a pocket full of money. My money long. I'm going to get some. Y'all can't stop me. Next month, go on like the wind. This is the biggest problem with this business. And it really trips up a lot of people. It's a lack of commitment. It's plain and simple. And this is something that will transfer to other areas of your life. Understand, it's probably going to take you a good year to really start amping up in this business. And it's not because of quote unquote the competition. Because if you remember what I just told you, this was happening 
before the television shows. The television shows have nothing to do with this. Human nature, the American work ethic, have everything to do with this. Everything. You know, we've grown fat, lazy, and just sloven. We're like, you know, if it ain't easy, I don't want to do it. If it ain't easy, there's something wrong with it. So, by properly setting your expectations, you can be successful in this business. Because you're going to go out there, and in the beginning, it's going to be rough. If in your mind, you're like, okay, I know the first three, four, five, six months are going to be rough, and you move through that, you're not disappointed. But if you think that you're going to go out there and you're supposed to be making big money really quickly, you know, like one of those late night infomercials. Well, hey, you know, you just go down to your computer in the morning and bam, there's two thousand dollars while you were asleep. No. Now, in the beginning, that's not going to happen to you because you don't have the expertise to set that up. So know that there there's a certain grooming process. And once again, money has nothing to do with it. Just, you know, give you a quick example. Say you have $500,000 in the bank. Cash money, your house is good, your family's good. You can essentially take $100,000 and if you lost your ass, it's not going to impact you or your family one way or the other. So you come out and you just start buying units. You just, you know, you got the money, you get everything you want. And at the end of six months, you're like, I'm not really making any money. Now, say you have $4,000 in savings, and that's all you can spare. So you come out, and you don't buy everything you want. You pass on units, and you work your ass off, and you buy good units, and at the end of six months, you've actually in the black, and you're doing quite well. Now you've got 20000 to spend. That happened to me. The difference is, when you have a lot of money, it gives you a false sense of confidence and expertise. It's like, hey, I got money. I'm the man. No, you're not. You're just someone with a lot of money. And as the old adage goes, a fool and his money are soon parted. That's the reality. Even with a lot of money, if you don't approach this business with the right level of commitment, it's not going to work. And that's what you see because people chide me for not watching the shows because I am like probably 50 episodes behind because I have them on DVR and I watch them here and there. But the thing is, that's not going to teach you how to do this business. It's not. And, you know, it will set the tone for you going, hey, you know, all right, I might want to do that. But there are so many things that they don't even talk about. They don't even sell that. I just sit there and I'm like, well, you know, that's $50. That's $100. That's true. They don't even mention that stuff. It's just for these curious and wonderful and unique finds. That's great for TV. But for your professional business, for your store, you will lose. So by having the proper mindset. It's going to take you much further in this business than someone coming out expecting to hit a home run in the first month. And believe it or not, many people have the expectation. They do. They think, oh, you know, I am going to um, go out here and kill it. I'm going to go out here and make a lot of money really quick. Even in the good old days, that didn't happen. One of the things that I talk about a lot in my YouTube videos is having a certain type of mentality. Something that I noticed when I first started going out to the auctions was how many people had a loser's mindset, which were predicated by things like this that I would hear frequently said, well, I should get my money back. I hope to get my money back. I hope to do well. And I just heard this over and over again, and I look at the people saying this stuff, and they may have been in the business for several years, but they didn't really look like success. And I'm not trying to be snooty and saying that, hey, if you make a certain amount of money, you have to dress a certain way. I was just looking at their vehicles. The tires were bald. The vehicles were not in good repair. I mean, you can look like a bum, but if you're making money, you're going to take care of the things that are taking care of you. And they were pretty much just hand to mouth. And many told me, it's like, don't try to make this a full-time business. You know, you'll be lucky to make some money. I never adopted any of those mindsets. Making money is not a matter of luck. It's not. It's a systematic program 
that you put into play by taking information, looking at that information, coming up with an analysis, and then coming up with a plan. You got to have the mentality of a winner. You have to tell yourself, I can do this, I can do it well, and I can make money. Sounds overly simple, but I want you to think about this. How many people, yourself included, you know, who say things like if you go in the room and someone's looking nice, oh, you know, you look really good in the dress and you can't even go, well, thanks, and move on. It's like, well, I'm okay, or, well, yeah, you know, I try. You know, one of those self-defeating, my esteem is in the toilet type comments. That stuff impacts your success in every aspect of your life. Do not go into this business hoping to make money, wishing to make money, because what you put out is what you're going to get. And believe it or not, 90% of the people who entered this business weren't making a lot of money or doing okay because they treated it like a hobby. Oh, it's something to do. I do a little few units, you know, get a few treasures, a few trinkets. That was the programming. And you, you can't do that. You have to tell yourself you're a winner. You have to tell yourself you're capable. And once again, this isn't about money. And this isn't about gender. This is about attitude followed by hard work coupled with a plan. You just can't go, oh, I'm successful. No, it takes more than that. You have to do, oh, I'm successful. Then you have a plan and then you implement the plan over and over and over. You have to have those three elements working together because you can get up and have a plan and you can work hard, but you have the mentality of a loser and you will fail even though you're doing 60, 66% of the things correctly. That's how important that mental aspect is. Now, come having a plan. One of the things that I've discovered from day one and then the biggest problem in this business is where are you going to store this stuff? In the book, I talk about prepping your home or you know, where are you going to store this stuff? Because this is the deal. And this is the little secret. You could go out in one day and essentially take up your inventory that you have in your personal abode. In one day, easily. Just completely take over that stuff. And it's a wrap. So what do you do? This is the thing about having a plan. You need to decide where are you going to store this stuff before you buy your first unit. If you live in an apartment, then it becomes real easy. You're going to have to rent some storage units to store your stuff. It's pretty easy. You cannot bring it into your apartment. You're not going to have the room. If you live on the second or third floor, it really becomes a non-qualifier. It's like, what are you going to do? Get the stuff, haul it all up to the third floor? No, no, don't do that. Rent a unit. Rent a unit and actually rent several units. I'll tell you, in the beginning, I've had anywhere from 15 to 20 units rented. I know, sounds obscene. Sounds like a lot of money. It was. But this is something you never hear in any of the shows. If you don't have stuff, you can't sell anything. And if you can't sell anything, you can't make any money. Your money in your wallet sounds real nice. I didn't lose any money because I didn't spend any money. No, you lost money because you came out, you spent time, you spent gas, you put forth effort, and you yielded nothing. So you weren't making any money and you lost. So you, whatever you're doing, you have to figure that out and you have to think big. You have to think really, really, really big. I'm going to tell you one of the secrets to my success was I started buying a lot of units early. I never just bought one or two a month. I always bought, you know, the first month I really started buying because, you know, in the beginning I kind of went out and just observed the lay of the land and didn't really buy anything because before I became acclimated to the business and developed a certain level of expertise, I thought those people were crazy. I was like, they spent 800 bucks for that? Now, looking back, I'm like, what a deal. <laughs> what a freaking deal. Didn't know. Didn't know what I was doing. Didn't know what I was looking at. And it was like, wow, now I understand. You're going to have to buy multiple units. This thing about trying to cherry pick units and just get a good one, then sell everything out that unit, then take that money, you will lose. You will lose because you're going to lose so much time, you're going to miss out on opportunities. But you have to figure out where you're going to start. Stow this stuff, prep it, and what you're going to work out of. Now, I'm also going to give you some numbers that you've never heard anywhere else. 
If you are a part-time storage auction person, your goal is to buy as many units as you financially can afford. Give you some parameters. Um, if you're buying five by five, five by tens, you know, stuff like that, small stuff, you need to get five to ten of those a month part-time, preferably 15. Because, you know, there's a lot of them going to be half empty, whatever. You have to think in terms of unit count. The more units you buy, the luckier you become. If you're full-time, hold on to your britches. 15 to 25. The bigger they are, the less units you have to buy. Say, you know, you're lucky and you can get 10, 10 by 20s. That's going to give you a lot of inventory. But you that's where you need to be. One of the questions that I would ask people that would come at me on YouTube or in storage auction blogs when I used to comment was, how many units have you bought this year? And it was always something less than 10. And that was like toward the end of 2011. They weren't even buying one unit a month. You are not going to be successful buying one unit a month in this business. Maybe one a week, one every five days. Okay, you, 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 get, a little, you get a little closer to it. But the deal is you buy multiple units. You have to. That's the reason you need to have a plan. Also, once you figure out where you're going to store this stuff or you're going to rent these units, you have to start building a team. I've said this in 2009. My partner, my partner, we, us, we. It was never just me. There's so many people that go out with their ambition, their truck, and a pocket full of cash, and they wonder why they're hitting the wall so quick. You can, you can only do so much stuff as one person. You're going to hit the wall in this business immediately if it's just you. One 10 by 20, two 10 by 20s may take you out for the month because it's just you. Build a team, build a tribe, create the wealth, share the wealth. You'll have more money. Part of building a team, once you figure out where you're going, and I'm going to keep hammering that home because that's where most people fall really short in this business. Once you figure out where you're going to store it, how many units you're going to rent, how you're going to work it, you know what type of truck you're going to have access to, what type of truck you're going to buy, whatever way you can move this, you have to think you're going to need two extra bodies. Yes, two extra bodies. These two people are going to be pretty much loaders. Because one of the things is to build your business is you're going to have to have people that do things you don't want to do or you don't need to do. I was the buyer in my business, you know, the buyer, the logistics and everything in the marketer. But you need, you know, you're not going to be able to outsource the buying to someone else, but you can outsource the listing. You can outsource the storing, the lifting, the moving of the stuff that you can outsource. So it leaves you more time to go to auctions because if you are buying selling, listing, moving, you're probably going to miss 70% of the auctions, which means you're missing a lot of opportunities. And as soon as you can get the help you need, you'll make more money. You're not going to have a six-figure income with just you and your truck and good lucks. It's not going to happen. It didn't happen to me. Like I said, I've always had help. You're going to need those extra bodies. And I want you to think about it. Say, you know, you have gross sales of 250, 300,000, and you actually have maybe 30, 40 grand in product cost. That's what you spend at auctions. So that's 210. And say you spend another 30,000 on labor, paying people and stuff. Okay. That's like 170. Then, you know, your taxes. And you still net out over 100 grand. And you're helping other people because you got to build an organization. You have to have an infrastructure. One of the reasons that so many people fail at this business is they don't see the large picture. It's all about me, 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 and what I want and how I want to do it. Even on the shows, that's what you see. You see Dave Hester is like the only one that had an operation. And he's hated because everyone else is just kind of coming out doing it on the wing and the prayer. I shouldn't say that. You know, there's probably other people with organizations but that's what you see this depicted on the show and the guy who actually has the organization is the one that's most hated 
Why? Because when you have an organization and infrastructure, you can buy more units, you can buy more units, you're going to become luckier more frequently, and you're going to make more money. Therefore, people will hate you. So as soon as you can build your organization, get that infrastructure rolling, the sooner you're going to start making real money. Now, this is something that people don't really talk about, and it's called a growth plan. If you get in this business, you have to have some goals. And say, you know, just to throw a number out there, say you have $500,000 a month that you can put into this business, which is great. You know, it gets you some units, get you started. What you need to do for a period of however long, say four months, five months, six months, is turn that $500 in operating capital into 5000 in operating capital, which means that, you know, you got to keep your job and you just continue to have to turn over the profits into the business until you grow your operating capital to like the $5,000 range. At 5000 believe it or not, even now, you're going to have more money to buy units than 75, 80% of the people out there. Uh, most people are going to be 1500 to 3000 And once they spend that, they're kind of tapped out till they sell something. So you want to get that five grand, then... You know, you can start pulling a little money for yourself and your goal to double that to 10. Because what happens is that gives you five to buy for normal stuff. Then it gives you another five to hold back for the big units, for the nice units. You know, you'll, you're at the auction. You will see a unit and you just know you can make money. You want and you don't have the money because you spent all your money because you didn't plan. In the beginning, you'll see that. But in a year, you can be at this level. And let me tell you what's going to happen. Say you got 5000 that means you can always buy. Doesn't matter if you're selling or not, you can buy. You have that other 5000 So you're buying, got stuff going into your inventory supply chain. Then, wow, bam, here comes this unit, and it's like four grand, but it's a 10 by 30 from the ruler to the fuller to the, you see stuff at the door that's like two grand. And it's like, okay, and you got it. And the thing is, you can spend it, but you're still going to have your regular business bringing in money. So if it takes you a while to sell it or it doesn't turn out as planned, you're still good. One of the reasons that so many people fail in this business is they do it from hand to mouth and there is no forward thinking on actually turning it into a real business. It's always treated as a part-time concern. And, you know, they use an old adage, when you put yourself in the position of a child, you'll be treated as one. To translate, when you treat you put your business to be a hobby, it will only give you hobby money. At some point, you have to step up and really, really think about this thing. Really think about where you're going to take it and what's going to be really relevant for your business. Now, this is some stuff where you absorb. We're about to go into the break. It's going to be a five-minute break. I'm going to have a little music playing for you. <laughs> And then we're going to come back and finish up the webinar. Don't be seduced by the overnight success story. One of the things that the shows is doing, and I knew it was going to happen. If you didn't know, I was actually up for a reality show and it didn't work out. And I had this conversation with the producers because, you know, I was saying, sure, you know, I had an idea that we can make a show and do it really well, but it was going to take some time because you're not going to get this nice stuff all the time. Sometimes you may have to buy 100 units. And I had set up the deal and everything, and that wasn't going to happen. I quickly discovered that reality TV is a cash cow because essentially by keeping the production costs low and keeping the salaries of the talent low, they can make a boatload of ad money. And I'm not mad at them. That's just business. But... It just didn't work out for me, and I think if I hadn't been such a difficult person to work with, it probably would have worked out, but I, it just it didn't work out for me. It didn't work out for me. But back to the success story. Overnight success is not normal. It's very, very rare, and people who are considered to be overnight success stories actually have been working anywhere from 10 to 20 years. It's just Bam, they, they hit it big and it's like, yeah, it happened overnight. No, they've been working forever and ever and ever. There is this notion that if you get in the business, you're going to make a lot of money really quick, hit the jackpot, and be on the beach with some bimbos doing your thing. And that's really not the case. Even in my case, it took two years for me to really understand the business 
and then really cross over that threshold of the six-figure income, which based on my business knowledge and having businesses that failed, having quite a few that failed because, you know, I started like five when I was in the, you know, between high school and being in the military and I didn't know what I was doing. I had no clue, but by those failures, I learned so much that helped me make business six through nine very successful. And it takes time. I know people don't want to hear that, but think of it in these terms. If you have a business that goes from nothing to something in six months, it can very easily go from something to nothing and even less. If it takes a little time for you to build the business, to get the customers because when I shut down my store, my neighbors, you know, every now and then I'll go by and talk to my old neighbors because they're good people. And it's like, you know, people kept coming by this space for a year looking for your store. So when you build it and you take your time and you do it right, it sticks and it just doesn't crumble apart. That's the fantasy of this Internet business stuff that you're going to create these beautiful, fantastic wealth building businesses sitting at home in your drawers without really doing anything. This is my take on that. What you give the world is what the world will give you back. And a lot of these internet businesses are all about manipulating and taking from something without really giving anything or providing anything. And that's just my opinion. That's one of the reasons that I didn't do the affiliate program and with ClickBank and all this other stuff because to me it's just, it's crazy. It's just crazy and it brings out a certain type of person. I'll give you an example. Uh, when this thing was really hitting the head, I got contacted by all these internet marketers, and they was like, hey, do you have a plan? I got a downline. I got this, this, this. And these people were had no interest whatsoever in really being in the storage auction business or actually helping anyone. It was like, okay, if I can move X amount of products, I can make money. That was it. And like I said, once again, just like with the TV people, I'm not mad at them, but come on. You know, when that is your primary focus, you're going to take shortcuts, you're going to do the wrong thing, and you're going to create this mess that we have. And that's just my reason that a lot of this online stuff doesn't work because it's not really built on sound business principles. It's really not even built on quicksand. Quicksand has more substance than this stuff. But that's just me. That's just me. Now, we're going to discuss some business principles with the storage auction business, and I'll, hopefully I can make it very, very clear for you. You make your money when you buy. I know you've heard that expression, and I'll break it down for you so it's forever broken. When you buy something, the price that you bought that item is irrevocable. It's not going to change. It's a done deal. You spent five bucks on it, you spent five bucks on it. The price which you may tr attempt to sell that item can be very, very malleable. It may be... You could sell it for 15, but you may have to capitulate and sell it for nine or maybe even five just to get rid of it. So that's why you make your money when you buy. You also have money when you have stuff to sell. One of the things that I've seen on many of the storage auction boards is people like, I got stuff, I need to get rid of it so I can get some more stuff. You're going to have to become a manager of stuff and inventory to make money. It's really nice and wonderful that you can buy a unit, then sell it, then buy another one, then sell it, because that way you can kind of capture your gains and you can see how much money you make it. I'm going to tell you, it's not going, it feels good, but it's not going to make you a lot of money long term because you're going to be missing out. Because I discovered when I hit the auction trail five days a week, our income doubled. Now it's like, and there you go. How could it double when you're always out buying? This is the reason why. Give you a scenario. You go out on week one and you get 10 units and you spend, say, five grand. Those 10 units are going to generate seven to nine thousand dollars profit because, you know, they're okay units. You know, you're just going to double your money. They're okay, but you're still making money. You're clearly going to black. Then you go out in the second week. And you're spending five, but you get some jackpot units, and they're going to yield about twenty-five thousand. You know, five times your money. Then you know, so okay, so bam, you know, you spent ten, and that first week gives you profit of seven, but the second week gives you a profit of twenty-five. So that's thirty-two grand. Then you go out the third week, and it's another okay week. 
you spend five and you're like at 15, three times your money, but you know, that's 10,000. So you're at 42. Now, the thing is, you have to consistently go out and buy and have this inflow outgo sales matrix. If you do what a lot of people want to do, they go out and buy one or two units, get the units cleaned up, get everything processed, get them up on eBay, Craigslist, whatever sales channel, then sell. Then once they realize that everything is sold and they have money, two to three weeks have gone by. <laughs> so you actually missed the chance of coming across a jackpot unit because you have not set your business up. This is one of the reasons that I came across so many jackpot units because I was always out there. And there was a heavy cost to that because, you know, there's some places they won't let you rent. That was very rare, but you had to get those units cleaned up. And this is what I did. I realized, and I got this from one of my sales managers. And he's like, 8 p.m. to 6 p.m. was sales time, which means anything that wasn't sales-related activity didn't need to be done during those hours. And I was like, when does that stuff get done? He's like, well, you know, before 8 or after 6, which means, you know, certain emails, collecting your collateral material. And I took this same approach to the storage auction business. Monday through Friday, a few Saturdays, you know, between 8 and 5 was acquisition of inventory. So if I had to load the unit, that meant getting up with chickens, cock a doo doo getting that unit cleaned out. Because most places, the gate opens at 6. If you know what you're doing, you can actually get those 24-hour gate codes. Sometimes you have to ask. Get up at 4, 5 in the morning. Get that unit cleaned out. Have the truck at the warehouse waiting on my partner when she got there. And be at that first auction at 9. Then buy stuff. Then when the day's over in the auction, you know, when I can't buy units anymore, then go get the truck again and load up some more units, which created a very long freaking day. But that was the way I was able to get around the whales because, you know, I outworked them. And, you know, if you're looking at turning this into, let's just put out solid numbers. If, you know, you're currently making 50 and you want to make 50 to 100,000 in this business, that's what you're going to have to do. Because understand, most people are not going to do that. And that's why you need help. And that's why you need to build a team. Because I think just from talking to a lot of people, because understand, before the TV shows came on and before I had the YouTube channel, you only talked to your people in your local circle. There wasn't a lot of, you know, national talks about storage auctions. What happened in this town is what happened in this town. And what happened here is what happened here. And by writing the book and creating a YouTube channel and talking to people all across the United States, it was really interesting to find that storage auction behavior was the same in virtually every part of the country. That really, really surprised me because, you know, like I said, it's very esoteric. Everyone keeps their information very close to their vest. I was like really, really amazed. And a lot of people are small time operators because they never plan to grow their business. But you got to think of your business that way in terms of, you know, what do you want to do? If you want to be part-time and you just want to, you know, get a few treasures, a few things, nice things for yourself and, you know, shoot the, shoot the shit with the guys on the auction trail, that's cool. I'm not saying you have to be a full-time auction now. What I am saying, if you really want to make decent money in this business, decent money being 50K and above, you're going to have to put out and... I didn't really think that was a lot of money because based on the jobs I had and, you know, the success of my business, I didn't think it was a lot of money, but we all tend to live in our, our own skulls. And, you know, what's not a lot of money for me, but to this guy in Texas who's 27 and the most money he's ever made is what he made at McDonald's and working at, at the, uh, you know, the service sector jobs. He was thrilled. Uh, I have a lot of success stories and, it seems to be that the people whose backs were pressed against the wall are the most successful because they had to make it work. You know, if you are doing well and, you know, your life's kind of cozy and you can take your vacations and you've got money in the bank, what's your motivation? Seriously, if you don't have a high level of motivation, you're not going to do what it takes to really amp this business up because you don't have to. I've noticed that. 
And it's not an education thing. It's a press thing. It's a dire situation thing. It's like when your back's against the wall and you have got to make things happen, you tend to pull whatever you need to pull from wherever you need to pull it to make things happen because I've got a lady in South Carolina that's just freaking amazing. And understand, she ain't making like boatloads of money by, you know, conventional standards. But in her small town, where she is, you know, she averages thirty-five to forty-two hundred, you know, a month. She's she's like living the La Vida Loca. And understand, you know, she told me she said the most she ever made in her life was twelve hundred bucks a month. So you know, she's making three to four times what she used the most money she ever made in her life working for someone else, and you know, her life has changed. And, you know, I had to step back. And that's one of the reasons I never, like, said, you know, threw out these huge numbers because I know everyone's not going to do that. But, you know, 30 to 50 grand a year full time is very doable. And depending on where you are in the country, that's a lot of money. If you're not like, you know, in Atlanta, that's not so much because, you know, things are very expensive here. But if you're like in a town where, you know, rent for an apartment is three, four, five hundred bucks a month. You break it three, four grand, you're one of the town's wealthiest residents. So, you know, all things are relative based on where you are and what you do. But that's some of the stuff. Now, in terms of being super successful with this business, you have to reorient your way of thinking. You are a resale professional. What that means is you find stuff to sell and make a profit on your finds. That's what you do. That's what storage auctions are about. That's what picking's about, the antiquing, the state set. All of it is getting something that you can resell and make money. Now, to really become good at this stuff, you have to think of yourself as a problem solver. You know, it's like I get stuff low and I sell it high. You know, anyone can do that. But when you learn how to solve problems for other people, you will make more money. Because what got me into this business was this company that I was trying to sell some office furniture to. And they had all this used office furniture. And there was a few guys I had that would like do wholesale liquidations. They'll buy everything from a company. And other guys wanted the stuff because it was too small. My company hated doing that stuff. So I, I did it on my own. And made a lot of money and actually sold them the furniture. But one of the things that I had to get rid of was a freaking generator. I've never sold a generator. I didn't know anything about it. It actually took me a week of study to figure out what it was and you know find out the right people. But by becoming a problem solver, I netted out well over 60 grand on everything between you know what I sold them and what I made on commissions and stuff. And this was a very, I wouldn't have made that. I probably, if I just sold them the furniture, I would have probably made 5,000 commission. <laughs> I know. I was sitting there like, and it just changed my life. You know, it's like, oh, okay. It was a lot of work. It was a lot of heavy lifting, a lot of phone calls, a lot. Of, it, it was a lot involved. But you look at making five grand versus making 60 in roughly the same time frame that it would have taken me just to sell them the office furniture because the th it doesn't move fast. You know, I have to look at stuff, or we're going to order stuff, or we're going to do custom fabrics. There's a lot of back and forth going to showrooms and stuff. And I was just like, oh, I need to do this more often. And that's why I think we were real successful because, you know, just simple stuff. Like, okay, you go to a unit. And you see some nice furniture, okay furniture, but say the seat has a rip. That's very easy to repair. And that'll turn off the average person. They're like, ah, this is how hard it is to repair seats for dining room tables. You take the seat off. It's going to be four or six screws. You unscrew them. You get some fabric. You know, if it's some, like, toughing, you may need some more cotton stuff. This stuff you can get at a fabric store very cheaply. I'm talking under 10 bucks. And... We never bought fabric because we got so much fabric out the unit. And we'll just save it. And essentially, five minutes, staple gun, screw the seat covers back on. The things look brand new and you actually can sell them for more. It's a real quick and easy fix. But most people are looking for it's clean, it's wrapped up. Uh, I have bought units that look like hell because I can see the beauty and I'm like, okay, once that is like cleaned up, it's going to be awesome. Once I do this or do that, it's going to be awesome. Here's another quick trip, like a uh, quick tip for leather. 
you see your leather sofa and you know it's looking kind of you know if it's like beige and it's cracked I wouldn't I would pass but if it's like a nice brown a nice black you can just go get some leather conditioner or believe it or not I did this once I don't know if it's gonna work and everything I've actually used baby lotion and baby all on the sofa and a buffer <laughs> Put the stuff in there overnight, hit the buffer on it the next day, and that sucker looked nice. And you know, I was like, okay, I don't know how this is gonna be. So didn't sell it for three, you know, three weeks just to see, because I didn't want to sell it and this thing was gonna like trip out on the person. And it it worked. It, it didn't rub off, it didn't stain clothes, and I was able to sell a sofa that I got out of a unit that a five dollar unit for four hundred and fifty bucks. Yes, that's what problem solving will do. If you kind of go into this thing saying, hey, it's going to be hard, but I'm the guy that can actually change things and solve these problems, you're going to make more money because you know that other people pass on. And that's why, you know, if you look at all the huge catalog of, of videos I have on YouTube, like this one that's called Stinky Units Will Make You Money. This is the very principle. A little older something that comes out, and I'm not saying buy something that's super foul. It could be chemical. It could be dead rodents. It could be, I bought it, but, you know, other people get turned off and walked away, and you get this unit for five or ten bucks, and you get in there, and there's nice stuff, and you make two, three grand. Doing the things that other people will not do will make you a lot of money. And in this business, because American culture is going through a revolution right now. You know, I grew up in the age where kids were expected to do chores. Kids were expected to do manual labor. And now it's like everyone has their kid on a college track and no, they can't do this and they can't do this because they're going to college. And just my opinion, I did a video. Most college degrees are not worth the paper they're printed on now. And because society has changed. There are more people with degrees than ever before, which actually lowers the value of a degree. When only like 20% of the country had degrees, you know, it was a higher premium. But that's just me. You know, I'm not going to get too deep into that because uh, I'll be putting those videos uh, on my other channel. Something else to talk about. Storage Wars is really, really good for this because it tells a story and it lures you in. We're going to go to this Oceanside town and we expect to get blah, 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 blah. Really? I have gotten killer units in the middle of the hood. To explain how this happens... A lot of people, especially since I've been in the business, when they rent a storage unit, they usually go online for the special. And they will be directed somewhere else, you know, depending upon inventory of the storage facility. So say they like live 10 miles away. There may be a storage place a little closer, but they'll get a better deal of the place a few miles away because the, you know, the, what is it, the census the occupancy rate is kind of low. So they're trying to get stuff in there. And it's not even in their neighborhood. Uh, pods is a prime example of this. Whatever's in pot, pot, stuff from pods can come all over your city. So getting caught up on that neighborhood thing and not knowing how the storage business really works, you could be like falling for an okie doke. Uh, I will give you an area that is the straight up hood here in Atlanta. It's uh, Gobby Road College Park. And it's a little beat up storage facility. And I went over there and it was actually a crowd. And it was like, they had 100 units and it was 35 people. I bought 10 units there, spent two grand. And one unit I got, I think they were counterfeit. I don't know. But it was full of Nikes, Nikes, Air Jordans. I'm talking about 130 pair. I was selling those things for 80 to $150 on eBay. It was smack dab in the middle of the hood. I also got a room full of very, very nice antique furniture that day. I got some, a janitorial service company. I got everything, the buffers. All this was in the hood. Did I say two grand? I did very well off that stuff. And it was in the hood. I'm not saying be stupid, but I'm also saying do not be seduced into this way of thinking that you're only going to get good stuff in, in well-to-do neighborhoods because it's been my experience here in Atlanta like coming Alpharetta 
uh, Duluth, there, and that's the thing, Dunwoody, Sandy Springs, but there's a lot of well-to-do neighborhoods, but I, I just can't consistently say going to those neighborhoods got me the better units. Actually, the best unit that I ever bought, and that was the unit I got the safe in, was in Conyers in a very kind of in an industrial area. The neighborhood was not the hood. It wasn't like upscale. It was just kind of like a regular run of the mill neighborhood. And I got that unit there, and I got a lot of nice stuff at that property. So it really, really depends on you, your infrastructure in terms of sales, and basically your hustle. But you know. Don't, don't get really, really caught up in that. Now, this is something that I actually have changed my position on. I did not advocate it. I actually did it, but I always paid the credit card off that day or the end of the week. Using your credit card to buy storage units. Let me just say this straight up. It's going to be risky. I'm not going to say it's 100% guaranteed. It's going to be risky. But due to the fact that there's more people coming out. Units are going up. For you to get yourself in the game, you're going to have to spend a little money. If you have decent credit and you have high limits, this is what I propose. Say you have a credit card, you know, $25,000, $30,000 limit. You carve out 10% of that card because it's not going to mess up your ratios, which say if it's $2,500, if it's $2,000, that's $2,500 you can use for auctions. And say, you know, you got, you know, $30,000, $35,000 credit limit. That's three grand at thirty five hundred. Ten percent of your credit limit, and if that is if the card has no balance, you use that money. If you spend the money after your statement date, so your statement date the sixth, you spend the money the seventh. It's not going to post on your report until the next month, and you can do like a sixty day float to pay that money back. That once again is risky. Let me just be hundred percent honest with you. It's risky. But that's a way that you can get yourself into the game with some units. Say you are like an average person with a decent income. And you probably have anywhere from fifty dollars to $80,000 in credit limits. Maybe one hundred and fifty. Okay, so that moves that 10. Now, this is if your stuff's paid off. Like, you know, if you had like a ratio of 50% where you used to have your credit units, don't do this. <laughs> don't do this because you're just going to get in more debt. But if you, you, know, you manage your credit well, wisely, you know, 10% is not going to hurt your score and it actually gives you money. And if you know how to float it, you can float, like I said, you can float this money during, you know, six, 60 days. If you know what you're doing, you should be able to pay that money back and you'll realize profit. Now, that's how to properly utilize other people's money. And I keep, I keep saying it's risky. I'm not going to sit there and go, oh, you know, this is 100% guaranteed, you know, and also, to give you more help, do not use this money on crappy units, like little units, 100 to, no, you save this for the big boys. Like, you know, there's a 10 by 20, there's a 10 by 30, there's a lot of stuff. That's what you save it for because more and more places are allowing you to use your credit cards. And I think going forward, this is going to be the norm because uh, people are getting robbed. Uh, oh, yeah, don't leave your money in your car. Don't do that. I never left my money in your car. Uh, you know, quick breakdown. Say you've got like, you know, 10 grand on your cash, you know, 2,500 in one pocket, 2,500 in another pocket, and five in your wallet. If you got hundreds, it's still going to be kind of thick, but you can kind of spread that out. But do not leave your money in your car. Don't ever do that. Um, but, you know, and also doing this, you can get points out the wazoo. But that's just kind of the framework for you to use credit cards to actually help you with your business but be very very careful and the reason i'm softening that stance is i don't know if you've noticed but all of a sudden my my, my mailbox full of credit card offers and they had like disappeared for like two years three years because at one point i was getting like you know two or three pieces a week then it went down to one. Then it went down to like one every two weeks. Now we're back up to five, six, seven offers a week. It's like they're like, hey, here we are. Here we are. They're just throwing stuff at you. And I'm just like, ah. But once again, it's risky. And once you hit that limit, you can't spend anymore. And the reason I say that is, okay, 
say things go to shit. Say you, you know you buy some crappy units. It's ten percent. You got to pay it back. You can pay that over time, and it's not going to kill you. But once again, do this with a great deal of caution. Save it for premium units only, if you have to use it. Because ideally, you want to be in a cash only position. That's going to be the best way to go uh, in terms of buying units and making money in this business. Another thing that you can do that we're going to get into a little deeper is source from other areas because I'm going to get into a different section about that and how to do it and how to set it up. In this section, we're going to discuss starting a storage auction business. Let me make that distinction once again. Starting a storage auction business. Something I touched on, but I'm really going to get very deep with this. Many people treat this business as a hobby. Don't do that. Predicate your mindset where this is a business. Now, one of the things that you need to do is build your infrastructure. What do I mean when I talk about infrastructure? Everyone thinks that, hey, it's about just getting this stuff, going to some shop, getting an appraisal, and then sell it some later date. No, building your infrastructure first starts with how many people that you know that you can sell to. This is something a lot of storage auction people don't do. They don't, their friends and families don't really know that they're in the business. Now, I understand you have to do this a certain way. You know, you just can't say, hey, I got this cheap and you're going to get it cheaper. No, it's like, look, I buy stuff and I sell stuff. If there's anything you need, let me know. Compile that list of everyone that you know. Everyone. Also, while you're compiling that list, work on another list of everyone you don't know really deeply. You know, people you casually know, people at work, people in your church. Now, this is going to be a little strange, but you're going to actually go to the strangers first. Because once you start selling to friends and family, they're going to want like super discounts and you can't give them that because that's going to erode your profit margin. So you go to the strangers who are not going to be expecting such a deep discount. And that's what you're going to build your business with because you have to learn how to talk to strangers. You have to learn how to sell yourself. And just think of all the people that you could potentially be a benefit to. And just go over, introduce yourself, print up some cards, let them know that you sell stuff. And I'm going to say something that's going to shock you. When you get up to 250 people, 300 people that actually know that you buy and sell stuff, you'll have some consistent money coming in. Most people are going to hit their friends and families, you know, and after, you know, 15, 20, 30 people are done. And that's actually the worst core group to start with because of the deep discounting that they're going to want. Or they're going to try to make you feel guilty. You know, once you're a success and you're moving stuff, and you're like, hey, you know, you can get this if you want to. But if not, I have regular customers. And believe it or not, many of them will actually start paying you a fair penny because you actually took the time and effort to build a real business. So that's part of your infrastructure. Another part of your infrastructure is, you know, where, where are you gonna where are you gonna store this stuff? I mean, you know, we talked about it. Where are you legitimately gonna store this stuff? If you're renting an apartment, you have no choice but to use storage facilities. If you have a house, okay, is the house really set up where you can actually run a business out of it? Because if it's like some of these newer houses where people have these big houses and empty rooms, hey, you're in a good situation. Then you have to ask yourself, do I really want people coming to my personal residence? And for many, the answer is going to be no. For many people, like, I really don't care. You know, it just depends on what you're selling. I never sold guns out the house. I liquidated most of my gold to a refinery. Um, so at home, I didn't really keep anything of value. I will tell you this. When I sold my last house and I had like a garage sale and pissed off all of my neighbors. I literally sold stuff off the walls because everything in it was out of storage units. And in making a clean sweep and moving forward, I felt it was best just to get rid of all that stuff because also a lot of that stuff reminded me of my partner who passed and really was just a little hard to deal with sometimes. It's like, oh, we got this at this point. Oh, we... And I really had to make a decision to move on. I just kept a few really, you know, more sentimental than anything things 
and just sold 99.8% of that stuff, you know. Uh, I had one a really nice dining room set, mirrors and stuff, and I just sold all that to one lady for four grand. She's like, I'll take the room. <laughs> but other than that, what are you going to do with, I mean, seriously, you, you really need to figure that out because this is what's going to be the big problem. You're going to go out there and you're going to be pumped up. You're going to see a room. You're going to want to buy it, but you're not going to buy it because you don't know what you're going to do with it. You're like, okay, God, that's nice, but what can I do with it? Most people buy based on what they can move, not based on what the potential value of the unit is. I know. I've, I've watched this over the years. I've, I've seen it happen. I've seen new people, and they're like, oh, God. And I'm just like, they're looking at a killer unit, and they're like, God, there's so much stuff. There's so much work. And I'm going, that's so much money. I'm just going to let you keep looking at that, and then, bam, I'm going to jump in and start bidding. And that's the deal. You, you have to build that infrastructure. You know, customers, logistics, logistics is where you're going to store it and how you're going to move it. And seriously, you know, one of the reasons it was really frustrating answering questions was I was getting questions from people who didn't even have the basics. It's one thing if you don't have a car. I mean, it's one thing if you don't have a truck. But if you don't have a car, you, you're really not in a position to do this business. You know, if you get a car, you can get to the auctions, you can buy rooms, and you can work your way up to buying a truck. You can do that. I did that when I first started. I did not have a truck. You know, four months later, I did because renting will be very, very expensive. And here's a tip for renting. If you're in a position where you have to rent, this again, going back to the beginning, if you rent a truck to move six units, you're going to spend roughly the same money if you rent the truck to move one. So the economy of scales kind of kick in. That's why the infrastructure is so important because once you get the truck, you have the truck. And that's a sunk cost. And then after you pay it off, it's done. But as long as you keep renting, now what you can write off on your taxes, but I'm going to address that in a minute. You know, you can do that. But one of the things that I recommend is build your business as fast as you can. Sit down, have goals, and I want to be at a certain point in six months and really, really push because this is what's going to happen going forward in the future. Most people are going to come out, treat it like a hobby. And they're just going to kind of, bam, hit a ceiling real quick. The people who take the time, effort, and energy to grow their businesses are going to be the ones making the money. And that's going to be like one out of 100, one out of 250. Those people do that because it takes a certain level of commitment to be successful. So you build it as fast as you can. And also, stay off the radar. As long as you can. What is the radar? And get people saying, hey, you know, I want to get my business license, get an LLC. Don't do any of that for at least six months for two reasons. One, you really need to see if you're going to stay in this long enough to actually make those investments be worthwhile. Also, once you, do, you get a business license, then they start sending you stuff and then there's other things and then Six months, maybe a year, you stay off the radar as long as possible. I'm not saying don't claim it on your taxes, but when you're off the radio, radar, you don't have the business license, you now you may want to get a resale license, which is not that daunting and it's free. And you don't have to pay taxes on your units, which can add up to a pretty chunk if you're buying a lot of units per month. But with staying off the radar, you get to flesh this thing out and actually see if there's something you want to do, give, your, give yourself some time because, you know, I've get emails where I'm like, hey, I'm buying a building. I'm like, you're buying a building? Do you even know if you like this business? Because it's not for everyone. It's not. It really isn't. And therefore, by taking six months and saying, hey, for the next six months, I'm really going to do this business hard. And at the end of six months, you can say, hey, you know, this is for me. I want more or, eh, you know, this is not exactly what I thought. And then, you know, I, I get people who's like, well, I figured out. It wasn't for me after going to the auctions three or four times. I'm like, no, you didn't. You put forth really no effort. You just saw, damn, it's going to be a lot of hard work, and you punked out. That's what happened. It's not a question of if it's for you. You put no effort to it. It's kind of like relationships now. 
uh, people like you know one bad date you know, eh, that's it <laughs> the human condition is one of screwing up if you don't give people room to be human you're going to be one very lonely mofo on this planet that's just the reality of it and I know this is a good business and I know it can make you money it's just a matter of what are you going to put into it and how hard you're going to work it these are the things that are going to be required to be successful. So ask yourself that question. You know, you've got the book because, uh, to, you know, to touch on that, I'm doing things differently because I do webinars and I get people and they didn't get the book. And really, they were asking a lot of questions and there was a lot of redundancy. And it also showed their commitment level because, you know, if you notice, I pulled down all the cheap books and I pulled down the ebooks because I was getting people who were really not truly interested in this stuff and honestly they were a nuisance because they had a ton of questions and this is something you're going to find out if you don't already know on eBay the people that ask the most questions are the least likely to buy they already have a supposition in their mind that this is not that good or it may not be for them and they want you to confirm that and they're going to bug the shit out of you because they don't really want to do it or they really don't want to buy it. And they're just very, very paranoid and they're wasting your time. So I got rid of that. And that's one of the reasons I'm able to come in on videos and answer questions and be more interactive with people. Because I got rid of oh, probably 50% of the emails when I cut out certain things. Because I was dealing with a certain kind of person. And this kind of goes back to a video that I'm going to do or maybe already up about you can't be all things to all people. You just can't. You can't. And that's part of being a business owner and working your business because when you learn to separate the important customers from the non-important, yeah, and that's going to be the truth. That's going to be the truth. You know, we live in an America where people feel that if they pay you five dollars, they own you. Seriously, you know, five dollars. You know, I've actually thrown people out of my warehouse. Because they were just like trying to get something for nothing, being a pain, sucking up all my time, and paying me no money. Yet someone on Craigslist sees something, says, hey, it's mine. Be there in 30 minutes. Drop four, five, six, seven, eight, nine hundred bucks in my pocket and be out within 15 minutes. So, you know, that may be a hard line of attitude. But the thing is, this is your business. And you really have to think about how it touches your life and how it touches your enthusiasm, how it touches your energy. And if you let people kind of push you around, it's not going to be as fun as it can be. You know, sometimes when you say something to a customer, it's going to be harsh. You're going to lose money. And if you don't lose sleep over it that night, then it was the right decision. <laughs> it was the right decision. All right. So we're at the point where I'm going to wrap this thing up because this is pretty long. Just to let you know what's coming up. Um, hadn't set the calendar up, but this webinar will be replayed. I'm going to do it probably two or three times during the day, and I'll let you know. You're already in the queue. You're already on the hot list. And also, at some point... And I'll explain the deal with that. I'm going to have these printed up as a DVD. No, they're not included in the price. You know, I've been a prince and people have like been going nuts about that. If you want to buy it at that point, when it's done, then I'll let you know. It's just, I'm having issues with the people who are trying to do this. And I want it to look a certain way. And they're just like, uh, not listening. And that's what's taking so long. And also the Craigslist webinars coming in. There's going to be all types of business related webinars. Some are going to have a fee. Some are going to be free. So you're on the list. And when I get ready to do it, I'll let you know. This is probably going to take a month to do because I'm going to do the main session and then I'm going to do the follow up session. And I'm going to do the main session. Then once it's done, package it up. And then next month we're going to go into BAM, uh, the Craigslist thing, because I need to change some things because a lot of things have changed and there's new information. All right, well, that's it for this evening. I hope you learned something. And once again, remember, if you have any questions, send the question for the webinar to bootcamp at storageauctionguru.com. And I will front load that on the next webinar. 
which will be next Tuesday. It'll be next Tuesday evening. Same time, same place. Just letting you know. All right, this is Glendon, and you have a great evening.